Okay. So just to repeat myself, if everyone uh, who is uh, listening can have their mics and cameras off, um, we're going to be recording the session. And I think what we'll do is get started round about now. Um, my name is Edwina Atley and I'll be chairing. Um, our two speakers today are Mariana Janowitz and Lillian Chi. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to introduce the two speakers and then uh, Mariana will begin, followed by Lillian, and then we'll have about 20 minutes for discussion. Um, okay, so welcome to this session. It's titled Public Housing Domestic Objects. So our first speaker today is Mariana Janowitz. She's an architect, researcher, and member of the Feminist Design Collective Edit. Her project about foraging and rights to land was selected for the main exhibition at the Oslo Architecture Triennale in 2019. Her writing has been widely published and she currently works as research assistant at London Metropolitan University and associate lecturer at Newcastle University. With Edit, she worked on the 2021 exhibition How We Live Now, Reimagining Spaces with Matrix Design Cooperative at the Barbican. She also co-directed and co-produced a short film titled Laundry Day, currently being shown at Maxi in Rome. Our second speaker is Lillian Chi. Uh, Lillian is Associate Professor at the Department of Architecture at the National University of Singapore, where she co-leads the Research by Design cluster. Her research connects embodied experience and effective evidence with architectural representation and feminist politics. Her award-winning film collaboration, Zero Three Flats, has been screened in 16 major cities. Her current book projects are Architecture and Affect, um, published, which will be published by Routledge, and Remote Practices, Architecture at a Distance. She is currently co-directing a series of short films titled Objects for Thriving. Her forthcoming research explores the intersection of home-based work practices with domesticity through an effective feminist perspective. Um, okay, thanks very much, Mariana, when you're ready. Thank you so much, Edwina. Um. I will assume you can all see my screen and I will begin. Um, long poles loaded with items of clothing sticking out perpendicularly from windows and balconies of high rise residential buildings are a common sight in Singapore. What may appear to an untrained eye um, precarious or improvised is in fact part of a specially designed pipe socket system that has been built into the public housing architecture since its inception. Um, and why, why laundry? Um, why am I interested in laundry? Um, despite its spatial presence on an urban scale, laundry has not been interrogated um, very widely within architecture or architectural history. One of the reason f reasons for that might be due to its association with domesticity, the private sphere and women's uh, or reproductive work. The encroachment of the domestic sphere into the public realm has historically been and still often is controversial and ruled by societal notions of propriety more than genuine hygiene or environmental concerns. Laundry is interesting because it pierces the problematic boundary between private and public, existing instead in a strange liminal layer between the two. Um, I am going to begin by giving you a very short introduction to the history of public housing in post-independence Singapore. Um, upon achieving full self-governance in 19, uh, 1959, Singapore's ruling People's Action Party undertook a large-scale plan of rehousing the nation start, starting in 1960. The process cemented not only the national identity of the multiracial and multicultural state, but also PAP's political success 
um, and scholars such as um, Terry and George, Eunice Seng, Loka Seng, and Beng Hua Chua, among others, um, have discussed the kind of close intersection of building homes and nation building. Um, often cited as a roaring success, public housing in Singapore is currently home to around 80% of the resident population. The government's sweeping modernization um, program did not necessarily abide by Western ideas of democracy and the free market and was made possible by unprecedented levels of control exercised by PAP from a land acquisition program to natalist and racial quota policies. Um, and these images taken from Housing and Development Board's annual report in 1961, you can see sockets for laundry poles accommodated in the building's facade. My research for this study relied heavily on national publications uh, relating to housing, such as annual reports um, and other government publications. Considering the procurement and construction of public housing in Singapore is all undertaken in-house by the state's housing and development board, the vast majority of narratives around housing are also shaped by the state. This is why I consider the perspective of Lo Ka Seng particularly useful. Um, and in his book, Squatters into Citizens, the 1961 Bukit Ho Sui Fire and the Making of Modern Singapore, he employs a post-colonial studies perspective in order to challenge the prevailing narrative of, of modernization in Singapore. Loka Seng's analysis of kampong living or village living, branded by the authorities as backward and primitive, um, as its own version of modernity, helps in approaching the subject of laundry without the binary um, traditional versus modern frame of reference. I'm also uh, relying and indebted to Lillian Chi's scholarship, including the feature film Zero Three Flats, which has been particularly helpful in chipping away at the seemingly impermeable monolith of the housing narrative. Her insights on the situations of everyday life help shift attention to the individual stories and inner workings of the architecture, which is often seen mainly in statistics and on a macro level. Before I return to Singapore's public housing, I would like to take a short detour to summarize a sort of general spatial history of laundering, if that's uh, possible at all. Um, in Straight Homes, Edwin Adley writes about the practice of laundering and its spatial dimension. Uh, I quote, uh, the laundering of clothes marks personal and social, physical and metaphysical, spatial and temporal boundaries. Her view of laundry as provoking anxieties is especially pertinent to this study and to thinking about the complexities and overlaps between domesticity and modernism in Singaporean context. Adli brings the anthropologist Mary Douglas into her discourse, uh, whose theory of dirt as matter out of place is also particularly applicable to my research here. Uh, I quote from Douglas, if we can abstract pathogenicity and hygiene from our notion of dirt, we are left with the old definition of dirt as matter out of place. It implies two conditions a set of ordered relations and a contravention of that order. Dirt then is never a unique isolated event. Where there is dirt, there is a system. Before the modern era and the popularization of the washing machine, doing laundry was a communal affair and its spatial boundaries were delineated by necessity of water access. So it was a more structured um, scheduled ritual and it meant that once a week on washing day, laundry would extend its spatial boundaries and dominate houses and yards. The invention of the automatic washing machine changed these rituals and their spatial boundaries in many parts of the world. Personal machine and water supply meant doing laundry became individualized or more specifically assigned to the nuclear family unit. The new method of doing laundry changed not only the labor, 
but also the expectations around it and the social attitudes to its visibility in the form of drying laundry. For example, Diane Harris writes in Little White Houses about the American context of white middle class suburbia, where, um, I quote, the practice of hanging laundry outdoors to dry became associated with lower class living, especially as ownership of an electric clothes dryer became a sign of affluence in the 1950s. So returning to Singapore um, with this magazine spread, uh, PAP's efforts in res resettlement and turning Kampong residents into wage paying citizens were accompanied by extensive education, uh, educational campaigns. Um, and some of um, those um, campaigns can be glimpsed on the pages of Our Home magazine. Um, a publication distributed for free to HDB residents. Um, by HDB, um, it's a shorthand for Housing and Development Board, um, so shorthand, shorthand for public um, housing blocks. Um, the magazine aimed to educate the rehouse population on a proper and modern way of living in their new flats. So words, words like neighborliness, consideration and courtesy appear frequently to mobilize the citizens to partake in the national effort. A spread titled Washing Day Advice shows a cartoon side elevation drawing of balconies one above the other. Orderly rows of laundry are interrupted by an inconsiderate resident who stuck their mop out of their window to dry dirty water dripping on their neighbors washing below. The piece is concluded by a set of directions, do's and don'ts of the washing day. Further interesting glimpses of the design considerations and particularities of laundry drying in high rise housing blocks can be glimpsed in letters from residents published in our home. For example, in a letter in an issue from 1973, a resident writes asking whether they can hang their laundry in the shared access corridor where it would receive morning sun. The board replies, acknowledging that many similar requests have been lodged, suggesting there is a desire or need from the residents to reconfigure their apartments and shared spaces. However, the board rejects the request and lays out their reasons. The first one being aesthetic, making the blocks of flats untidy and unsightly. Clearly, outdoor laundry drying is not uncritically accepted, but rather it is governed by a set of um, clearly defined rules. In line with the board's pragmatic position, um, the response also points to safety reasons, explaining laundry in shared corridors could make the floor slippery. Further, the board's disapproval for bottom-up makeshift infrastructure is expressed. Uh, I quote, it has also been found that the columns at the corridors are damaged by the, uh, the tying of wires, strings and other contrivances for hanging clothes. The point is labored further by listing staining of walls, access issues and confusion as to which neighbor the clothes may belong to. Uh, the latter point brings to mind um, Lillian Chi's article, Keeping Cats Hoarding Things. Domestic situation, uh, situations in the public spaces of the Singaporean housing block, um, and the, the 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 writing specifically about uh, aversion towards ambiguity, ev evident in rules governing HDB living. Uh, residents are not allowed to keep cats because they roam freely, irrespective of administrative boundaries of private and public space. Clearly, laundry hang in communal spaces would also constitute a breach of the strictly defined boundaries of private and public living too. As Chi writes about cats in void decks and clatter in the corridor, I quote, they also highlight dissent between the idea of a shared national housing project and the liberties assumed of the domestic realm, end of quote. The last part of the response to the letter calls on the notion of proper, with the board asking residents for cooperation in hanging their laundry only in the designated places, quote, where proper pipe sockets are provided. 
in a typical slab block of 60s and 70s with an open air corridor with flats to one side. Laundry pole sockets were provided on the elevation opposite to the access deck, clearly belonging to the private household sphere, each laundry station assigned to a dwelling. Other letters and responses in our home illustrate the ambiguity and anxiety around the shared space, with residents complaining about bulky belongings or asking whether they're allowed to put houseplants out. There is a clear desire to control and order the clutter of the everyday. The status of objects changes depending on where they are placed, like in the previously quoted HDB response about laundry in shared corridors, causing the building to look unsightly and untidy. But there is no such concern where the laundry is hung in its proper place on the other side of the building. As probably the most common building type in Singapore, the public housing block blocks successfully form a sort of a congruous backdrop. HDB's own rhetoric seems to have emphasized the neutrality of the design, instead framing the development in scientific and technocratic terms. Lillian Chi again and um, geographer Jane M. Jacobs write about the perceived absence of design of Singaporean housing architecture. But she proposes that the seeming neutrality was a deliberate performance used to both accommodate, um, sorry, quote, both accommodate and normalize a value system based on the heteronormative and economically productive family unit. End of quote. The spatial rules of laundry are also tied to this ideology which champions the private property of the nuclear family unit. Despite um, diversification and changes of laundry practices in Singapore in recent years, HDB still develops and installs improved versions of the outdoor laundry rack in their buildings. The original system with a bamboo pole had many incarnations and was later superseded with aluminium fixtures. Uh, this contemporary video produced by HDB presents a new improved design for outdoor laundry drying rack. In the film, a resident operates a series of retractable metal poles with ease. The poles are mounted um, parallel to the building's facade, removing the need to lift the heavy laundry filled, filled pole which was commonly used in the past. Um, HDB discourages um, self-initiated repair and maintenance and advises residents to contact them with any issues. Despite HDB's uh, constant improvements to the outdoor drying rack, uh, it may no longer be as universal a choice as it was for the newly resettled residents in the 60s and 70s. Um, famous or perhaps notorious for its mastery of the environment, the air conditioner is perhaps the device that best characterizes the city-state today. Um, indoor automated drying system, uh, pictured here, is the bewildering love child that came out of the marriage of the washing pole and the air conditioning. Designed to be installed indoors, this high-tech washing line uses electricity to produce heat and breeze to dry washing. The process of drying laundry can now be frictionless and controlled. There's no need to lift heavy washing anymore or to take it back inside in case of rain. Uh, curiously, the fact that the room uh, needs to be air conditioned first in order for the device to heat it up to 60 degrees Celsius is not advertised. Um, to begin summing up, I would like to challenge the Western-centric analysis um, by uh, Jane Beamish and Jane Ferguson, um, who wrote a book about the history of Singaporean architecture. Um, and I quote, HDB flats could hardly be classed as innovative architecture until the most recent efforts at varying the silhouettes and exteriors, end of quote. 
And I think the seriousness with which design for domesticity was embraced by Singaporean modernism uh, speaks to that. And finally, even though environmental concerns may not have been central to the original idea, lessons can be learned from this piece of low-tech infrastructure in the age of climate uh, emergency. Uh, as Tim Waterman once wrote on Twitter, uh, low tech is still tech, and it is often brilliant, refined, and practical. So um, in an attempt at an impossible segue, um, I would like to end by uh, trying to open up this research and um, thinking about where it might go next. Um, so I'd like to show you a short clip from a film uh, I made with Edit Collective, um, in which I suppose we're building a case for the washing line, for low tech, for shameless displays of domesticity, and for serious consideration of reproductive labor and its systems in the built environment. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mariana. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for sharing uh, the film, which I think I'm right in saying you can also view online at the moment. Is that right? Yes, it's on. It's available on YouTube and it's about three minutes long. OK, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Lillian, when you're ready. Oh, Lillian, sorry, we can't hear you. I think you need to unmute yourself. Can you see my screen? Is it possible? Is it yes. Yes. Okay. We can see. Okay. okay. Now it's perfect. Okay. okay. Um, thanks, Mariana. That was great paper, and uh, I look forward to having a look at that video in more detail. I just wondered how you got up to the RIBA balcony. That's my question to you. Um, Thanks for inviting me and also many thanks to Edwina for sharing this uh, and Beatrice and Cube and London Metropolitan University for hosting this session. So <clears throat> what does it mean to live literally together next to on top and below each other? This question seems naive yet complicated. A separate architectural typology, the high rise and often also high density flat demands distinct emotional and behavioral, behavioral shifts in one's usage and perception of domestic space. The experience is now so normalized as to even be blasé to some. This evening's talk is situated primarily in Singapore, uh, which, um, which um, Mariana has already uh, introduced quite a bit, um, where the high-rise public housing is prolific in production, subscription, and influence. Embedded in a network of fiscal, social, political, architectural, ideological, and legal threats, it is administered by the Housing and Development Board, or HDB, a state-regulated body which has managed public housing on the island since its inception in 1960. Within its first four years, the HDB rehoused 400,000 people in 51,000 newly built units, an achievement which surpassed the 32-year output of its colonial predecessor, the Singapore Improvement Trust. The fact that public housing is simultaneously a formidable political instrument of reform and control, as well as the architecture of the mundane, creates a, a site laden with contradictions. It has been used as a form of birth control, in 1973, working class women had to undergo voluntary sterilization after having two children in order to qualify for public housing and to incentivize marriage and the reproductive family. HDB allocation prioritizes nuclear families and heterosexual marriages, and singles must wait until 35 years to apply for housing, coincidentally, the threshold age of a woman's fertility. The eponymous high-rise flats in the HDB's early years were constructed 
alongside a new policy guidelines that set out to regularize nationwide living standards, thus inevitably flattening differences and homogenizing these domestic spaces and their occupants. Consequently, its runaway success was founded on quantitative research focused on perfecting plot ratios, densities, occupation, occupant distributions, regional planning, transport and infrastructural connections, and a constant fine tuning of unit dimensions. Data was de rigueur in HDB's early years, and this commitment to quantitative research continues to define its contemporary production. As of 2021, the HDB houses an estimated 78.3% of Singapore's resident population, many of whom are also owner occupants. As a counterpoint to the prevalent quantitative and macro scale perspectives, my itinerary this evening pushes the polemically intimate. I employ domesticity as an analytical category, one riddled with discrepant and inadmissible evidence, relevant but disconcerting to the neatness of architecture. Uncomfortably proximate, domesticity needs to be studied with a new lens. Michel de Certeau and Luce Guillard argue that the examination of the domestic ordinary is a practical science of the singular. Against sweeping abstractions derived from research tools ill-suited to capture the inventive proliferations of everyday life, de Certeau and Guillard emphasize an attentiveness towards particularity and the concreteness of situations. I contend that domesticity yields its own aesthetic forms through routinized micropolitical performances. These, micro, these are micro, not in terms of skill, but in how they embed desire, resistance, and reverie, nested almost to the point of being undetected within a status quo. Thus, micro in terms of obscurity. At the same time, domesticity creates a precarious space of connections, transitions, and co-presence between the public and the private. It derives its momentum and reasoning from being in the in-between. In saying this, the realm of the domestic is coincident with the realm of effect. Thus, to think public housing through its domesticities is to see this architecture for its ways of holding together and dividing, proliferating or limiting lives and difference. Domesticity compels one to conceptualize public housing through effect. The effective potential of public housing is not concerned only with what this architecture is about or what it means, but rather what it can become, how it can act how it might relate to the changing world around it. The following narrative of the Singaporean high-rise is critically undergirded by residual traces of the occupant, which includes humans and non-humans. My perspective moves between several sources of evidence, from newspaper archives into architectural records before ending in an essay film titled Objects for Thriving. The resettlement of Singaporean residents into high-rise public housing in the 1960s is historicized as transformative and progressive. Its main achievement was the successful eradication of overcrowded, unsanitary and disease-ridden dwellings in and around the city core. Yet, as suburbs were systematically planned and built, open farmland and cemeteries were rapidly redesignated for urban rede redevelopment. The early 1970s saw the beginnings of the HDB new satellite towns accompanied by mass clearing and resettling of a rural agrarian community into these suburbs. Here are three short stories ensuing from the farmer's relocation to the high-rise block. In 1966, farmers who had recently moved into their new public housing blocks in a HDB new town at Kalang were reprimanded for keeping chickens. The caged birds lined the narrow external corridors, their cages camouflaged by flower pots. The excrement left a layer of white residue along these corridors and parapets and had to be regularly cleaned. Yet incessant clucking proved their final undoing and the corridor home chickens were hastily cleared. Urban husbandry of poultry became enough of an issue in 1973 and the HDB formally listed chickens in its list of illegal animals. In 1981, the HDB begins its fruit tree campaign with the planting of 11,000 fruit trees in 22 public housing estates. The planting of the fruit trees provided a way for resettled farmers to acclimatize themselves to suburban life and ease into their new high-rise living environments. Resident committee members were trained at a primary production unit on how to care for these fruit trees. Within three years, the number of fruit trees doubled to 22,000. The earliest fruit trees started to bear fruit. 
In four years, a staggering 15,000 suburban fruit trees were profusely fruiting. Yet the trees were inscribed as public urban property, much like pieces of street furniture. They were protected by laws against vandalism and theft. Signages warned against the plucking of ripe fruits. Fruit thieves were fined. Only officials and selected resident volunteers who had undergone the training program were allowed to tend to the trees. Newspaper reports started to detail how fruits began to rot and fall to the ground. Uncollected over a number of days, these fruits rotted back into the earth, leaving behind a slippery mess of bruised bodies, mold and insects. Such fecundity replicated itself across numerous public housing estates. In 1989, an agricultural theft was reported in the Yishun estate. A vegetable patch was raided. $200 worth of sweet potatoes were taken. The sweet potato roots were meticulously dug, leaving behind the surrounding soil and leaves intact. The thief displayed an acute understanding of fruit and ground sensibilities. Although living aloft, the primal instincts of these ex-farmers could not be completely weaned off. In the wee hours of Wednesday morning on 23rd November 1994, a cow and her calf were guided down a truck at the HDB estate in the estate at HDB block in the estate of Chochukang. As part of the Hindu ritual Gomata Puja or the cow prayer ritual, a long-standing Hindu tradition where cows like these would travel from farms in the outskirts to the city centre 20 to 30 times throughout the year to graze and bless high-rise flats all around Singapore. The two cows at Chochukang were herded into an elevator towards the Munyandi's new flat. Walking along the corridors of the high-rise housing estate with an entourage of caretakers and priests in tow, they were a sight for sore eyes. Inside the still unfurnished flat, Rachati, the cow, defecated onto the living room's concrete floor, much to the delight of her host. As part of the blessings, blessing rituals, both cows made a grand tour of the apartment before leaving. This tradition used to be fairly commonplace, but began to decline around the 1970s as people started moving into HDB flats. For their previous flat, the Munyandis did not get this blessing since cows are unable to manoeuvre staircases and there was no direct lift to their floor. In this case, the high-rise flat not only detached itself from nature, it also excluded supernatural blessings. Subsequently, the HDB flats began to dictate a natural selection of cow species, bred only for the purpose of making their blessing rounds in the high-rise. Cows were chosen from the smaller jersey species with a combined weight of mother and calf measuring a maximum of 250 kilos, which was well within the HDB lift maximum capacity of 1,800 kilos. Apart from size and build, the animal also had to be retrained. Cows were taught to enter and get off trucks, lifts, and to become accustomed to be led around the tight constraints of a flat. The divine was experienced in the smell of the beast and its dung. The warm splashing of urine on the cold concrete floor and the touch of hair and hide as cow and calf made their way around the high-rise flat. The impossible spectacle of the cows ascending through the housing board lifts, which at the time had transparent security planes, paints, sorry, juxtaposed elusive divinity and prefabricated technology. The persistence of the Hindu homemaking ritual personifies a resistance against the normativity of high-rise living. Together with the corridor home chickens and the rotting fruits, these are forms of reimagining how to live in a flat. The HDB's free plan ground floor with its pilotes defines what is known locally in Singapore as the void deck. An open space, an open covered space parsimoniously delineated by the same column grid that supports the architecture of the block above. It is a public space specific to HDB's distinctive slab block typology. This typology was introduced in the early 1960s, popularized in the 1970s, and last erected in 1985. A first generation design, the slab block took on various shapes that conform to the urban exigencies of different housing estates. The overall design of the void deck remained relatively unchanged throughout a period of 20 years. It was important for health and hygienic living since it provided thorough ventilation and larger open expenses for a densely packed population. The void deck is at the same time useful and ambiguous, 
its boundary condition precipitates chance encounters. The first significant mention of the HDB Void Deck as a purposefully designed open space was made in reference to the Park Road Development, a pilot project of the state-initiated Inner City Core Comprehensive Urban Renewal Programme in 1968. According to Alan Cho, then the HDB's chief architect, the city was an unhealthy environment that bred, quote, delinquency, crime, prostitution, dope, as well as neurotic diseases, end of quote. Thus, at its earliest stages, the Void Deck was employed to separate the residential units from the supposedly corrupting influences of the urban milieu. It functioned in the same way as the cordon sanitaire, or a zone of exclusion, in and through which the damaging aspects of city life could be mediated or filtered out. Defined by the extrusion of the structural grid of the domestic units above it, it repeated and reinforced the spatial rhythm of the flats. The void deck was porous to its surroundings, but also spatially independent of what was adjacent to it. Surrounded by a raised apron that defined the block from the ground plane, the edges of the void deck were marked by specific architectural points of exit for occupants and their waste. Stair and lift course open to one side of the block, mirrored by refuse chutes and waste stack, wastewater stacks on the other end. The open space of the void deck was, as such, suspended between these circulatory modes of people and their discards. It had a vague sense of both belonging to and not of the block of flats. The void deck's public character was ambiguously domestic and other at the same time. The proper usage of the void deck was subsequently left to interpretation and appropriation, and the list of activities happening here border on minor offences. People sleeping overnight, parking cars, littering, gambling, smoking, drug taking, and the presence and occasional use or abuse of cats. Through these occurrences, the void deck shifts in its intended role from the cordon sanitaire to being itself a salacious territory that needed to be kept in check. Architecture can produce certain kinds of bodies, just as different kinds of bodies co-produce particular kinds of architecture. Henri Lefebvre argues that spaces emanate particular energies, which are then played out through the user's relationship to those spaces. The body, he tells us, reacts not merely to geometry and form, but is galvanized by almost every quality coincident with that space, including interactions, oppositions, centers, and edges. In Lefebvre's statement, Architect space is produced through and by these aspects, both what is quantifiable and what is not. Certainly, if the tightly regulated dwelling and civic spaces of public housing were intent on producing a disciplined citizen homeowner worker, then the loosely regulated transition public spaces of the void deck is appealing in its lack of definition. At the void deck, the nightly prowl of illegally kept street or community cats confounds the differentiated boundaries between inside and outside clean and dirty, private and public, legal and illicit. There are roughly between 60 to 80,000 street cats in Singapore. In 2013, the HDB received 260 pet-related complaints, of which 150 were cat-related. Since September 1978, HDB regulates what it calls HDB-approved pets, which includes smaller dog breeds, birds, hamsters and rabbits. Cats have been excluded from the approved list because they are deemed ungovernable. Quote, it does not follow the grid system of the city. It does not walk on a leash and cannot be trained. It is unpredictable, nocturnal and transgressive. The cat disobeys any kind of spatial demarcation. The HDB website states, when allowed to roam indiscriminately, they tend to shed fur and defecate or urinate in public areas and also make cotton walling noises, which can inconvenience your neighbours. As such, cats are banned as pets in public housing. Yet any given block, illegally kept cats can be found resting around staircase landings and or strolling nonchalantly along the corridors and void decks. A cat is regarded as a risk, a vector of contagion, that may pollute the environment in its ability to carry something improper into the flat. Considering that the void deck was historically installed to minimise contagion by the city's uh, negative aspects, the presence of cats in this space appears to be a mildly annoying breach. However, this annoyance reveals something particular about the spatiality of the void deck. The situation of cats loitering in the void deck, cats whose owners cannot be identified, exemplifies the ambiguous public-private boundaries that occupants regard 
and behave in the void deck. Its completely porous and open space ages are contradictorily matched by its exact mapping of the residential unit structural grid, one gesturing to a, an unregulated access and the other a physical reminder of every unit's fiercely guarded privacy. It is a space that feels familiar and alienating at the same time. And this spatial ambiguity gives anonymity to the self-cat owner, who is also assuaged that their cats are roaming not far from home. At night, cats congregate in numbers at the edges of the void deck, meowing until their feeder arrives with their feet. On reaching maturity at five months, if not sterilized, cats are liable to mate and produce offspring. But perhaps more alarmingly, sounds of cats mate mating are audible even in a high rise. Cats are perceived to reproduce, quote, irresponsibly. Often these comings and goings happen within direct view of or at the void deck. The street cat produces an effective space of smells and sounds, which like the animal cannot be properly contained within or covered up, particularly in the open configuration of the void deck. As a space that is contiguous with the external environment surrounding the block, the void deck attracts because it is unrestricted, yet provides shelter and also, in the cat's case, food. Yet not surprisingly, cats appeal to those sympathetic to their streetwise and sensuous liberty. The free-ranging cat colony at the void deck is inevitably linked to the presence of a volunteer feeder who comes nightly to feed cats. Many of these nocturnal cat feeders are women who are usually single, divorced, gay, childless, or with children moved away. Thus, departing from the normative mother-wife profile indicated for public housing tenancy. These cat women are not necessarily residents of the block. Some drive to the cat feeding spot nightly, bags of kibbles in their car boot. Others come from neighbouring blocks. These are, these are also cats belonging to residents who roam the corridors and void decks. Although there is a high degree of tolerance for street cats congregating at the edges of the housing block for their nightly feed, there are invariably complaints regarding their hygiene. Cats at the void deck emote sympathy, affection, love, disgust, loathing or anguish. These different effects correlate to equally different perceptions of the void deck as public, collective, private or domestic space, as well as what should or should not happen here and who has rights to such an open and undefined space. The cat's affective embodied environment overlays and disrupts the void deck's autonomy. The presence of cats make residents notice and for some worry about the limits of their property. The cat's body, not unlike the other bodies prohibited in the void deck, gamblers, smokers and lovers, upsets the order and propriety of this open space. Through its cat situation, the void deck might be seen as a corrupting site, but at the same time, it also operates like a public space in its fullest sense, exposed to risk, chance, accident and event. The cat returns something primal, effective and visceral to the open space of the void deck. So this last section looks at the scaffolds of an ongoing research, specifically how the instruments of research um, intersect with and interrogate the architecture of public housing. I will first show a very short trailer that has sound, and the sound is important, um, and then I'll proceed to finish up this section. Thank <laughs> you. 
埋嘞，看有没有中，今天拜山。In the Singaporean inner city suburb of Wampao, four elderly residents recount their life stories sparked by the objects they hold dear. An in-progress work, Objects for Thriving, is a collaboration between architecturally trained filmmaker Ian Man, who I believe is in the audience in the call tonight, and myself. An essayistic video document, it is a proposition to understand how cultural memory is made and sustained through ordinary domestic objects. These objects enmesh protocols, belief systems, and technologies of survival. They are sites where everyday structures of feeling are deposited. A mid-20th century concept, structures of feeling, was introduced by cultural theorist Raymond Williams to explain how ongoing formations of taste and feeling are important cultural indicators of a historical milieu. To detect these structures, one must be attentive towards the worldings we are a part of. Tracing an embodied and relational notion of culture to look for structures of feeling, we need to look closely at as well as to look in between what is unremarked, to look at the corporeality of life. Objects for Thriving challenges the formalization and abstraction of heritage. It claims a space in the domestic sphere for personal, individual, familial, and kinship notions of effective heritage, tied to the typically unremarked complexities of everyday life. The ambition behind the film is not to possess authoritative knowledge, rather it is to conceptualize our roles as to what the architectural historian Kush Patel calls communal custodians. The term re um, refers to a person or persons caring for an evolving, caring for an evolving, um, archive of heritage objects still being used and tending to the recording of lived history still being experienced. The theorization of heritage born within a domestic context happens in the fine-grained narrations of stories and scenes. The segments of the essay film are anchored here by three objects, a sewing machine, a granite pestle and mortar set, and house charms or talisman. Initially aligned with the larger research pro pro project of which the film is part of, the aim was to record the presence of these objects for posterity, the film as a kind of memento mori, to produce a ground-up constitution of heritage. Yet the essay film, as a research instrument, literally opens, literally opens up the potentials of fieldwork. It, makes us look a, it, make, it made us look askew at the same objects, which though unremarked, become persistent in, persistent in their presence. Prospects for thinking about domesticity and architecture in ways unanticipated before start to avail. The essay film, the film theorist Timothy Corrigan argues, is a way of seeing that subject as much as it is about that subject. The essay film in its very format of self-expression allows the open-ended process of thinking and the possible conceptualization of new worlds through such thinking. That is to say, it is a space where thinking encounters a public sphere. That is, the researcher filmmaker's fluid thoughts are in place within with their audience. The essay film makes thinking effective. It makes thinking visceral. Filming is interspersed with discussion, editing, and research. A month ago, I would not have said that the frame of public housing is relevant to understanding the historical trajectory and significance of these objects as they seem to me now today. Yet, watching the footage that Ian has taken many times over, it is interestingly clear that the flat is central to inscribing the epistemological importance of these objects as markers of modernization, class, and gender. The three objects are things which do or did important work, much of these associated with the reproductive domestic labor of care. After Singapore achieved self-governance in 1965, the garment industry became the source of livelihood for many women who took on sewing assignments from home. A sizable monetary and space investment, sewing machines were nevertheless fitted into the older and smaller flats. 
The ownership of a sewing machine in a flat marked a commitment to economic independence. And by 1973, 81% of HDB households possessed a sewing machine, which surpassed the possession of television sets or radios. The weight and abrasive texture of a granite and mortar pestle is distinctive against the smooth surfaces of a modern kitchen. It sits firmly on the floor. The force of the pestle striking the mortar is heightened not just in its distinctive sound, pop, 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 but also registering as vibrations moving through the floor slab to the neighboring unit below. Before the din of next door renovations, there was the sound of the pestle and mortar. Used to manually break down herbs, seeds, and fruits into a paste for cooking. The pestle and mortar set is anachronistic in its, in its insistence on bodily labor. This distinctive this is distinctive in a modern kitchen where effective labor is visually disappears. Rubbish travels down central sh shafts, clothes are dried in washer dryers, or as, as um, Mariana has pointed out, that new device that cools or that heats up and warms the clothing. Food comes pre-packed or delivered only to be heated in seconds in a microwave. The use of household charms or talismans was widely practiced it is where it's still widely practiced in syncretic belief systems that prevail in Taoist and Buddhist households, where once homes would be erected following the auspicious locations determined, determined by Chinese geomantic principles of feng shui, mass housing precludes this luxury. Talismans are thus deployed as corrective measures to calm heavenly spirits and deities who might otherwise be deterred from co-residing in these properties. In the third household, two conjoined HDB flats are festooned with talismans so that the vital energy, life force or chi is restored. For example, exposed... Hey, we're not going to jump in to say we've got about six minutes left of the session. Okay. Oh, okay. So maybe let's, let me finish this. So, um, so for example, exposed structural beams in HDB flats are perceived as inauspicious, being said to divide and disrupt the flow of chi throughout the house. So as a coda, these speculative objects, fruit trees, cows, chickens, cats, and household things, allow us to rethink how the high-rise has both offered unbounded possibilities for inhabiting a new, as well as compromise some of our liberties. The potentials of high-rise living are brimming if only we can look past the architectural object, and if only we can reconceptualize this infrastructure effectively, looking closely again at its fine grain, inventive, and exuberant domesticities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lillian. That was absolutely wonderful and thrilling from start to finish. Thanks so much to both our speakers. Um, I feel like what we've been shown uh, encompasses a kind of grand history of resistance and disobedience. Um, and I'm really interested in the question Lillian raises, this naive, complicated question, how do we live in a flat? How do we live next to people, on top of people, below people? Um, and I guess something that we're interested in today is sort of pushing at the naive complexity, the complicated naivety of, of even sort of bringing these objects and practices into the realm of research and architectural discourse. Um, we don't have much time, but I would really love to hear from both of you because we both you both finished on um, these film projects. Um, and Lillian, you spoke about the film being a record for posterity. Um, and we're talking obviously about objects, but also practices. Um, and I wondered if you could both perhaps think out loud a bit about um, the the film's potential for recording and then making a new document of of practice. Um, uh, I don't know if Mariana, you want to start. Um, we only saw a snippet of, of your film, but to think about what you're doing by putting those um, beautiful washing lines in those different places. Um, okay, I will try to answer. It's, it is a very short um, film, so it's only three minutes um, 
in total and um, it, w it was commissioned by Maxi in Rome and the kind of very general theme that was given us was um, gender and space. So we became interested in the rules and regulations governing the drying of laundry. Um, so in London and in the UK, I think more broadly, it's very often um, forbidden by landlords or management organizations um, and also sometimes socially policed. Um, so in that film, in that final scene, you saw we attempt a sort of provocation, I suppose, by hanging a washing line um, at the balcony at um, Royal Institute of British Architects building. Uh, but we also kind of try to bring the washing line back into architecture, I suppose, um, because it is, uh, well, so spatial and so prominent and such um, an essential part of reproductive rituals. Um, yeah, but it was um, it was more of a performance. So we didn't get to record people kind of doing laundry. We um, we asked some friends and hired some actors um, and went on a uh, went into a laundrette um, and hung some laundry in the city. Thanks so much. And Lillian, the people in your films are not actors. They are showing us their own objects that they've used. But did they find it strange to be talking about them? Were they uh, surprised that you were asking about these these things that are very dear to them? Um, actually, I think that we didn't really. Well, maybe for the sewing machine and the pastel model, we did ask. But um, for like the the talismans we didn't because uh, it was kind of like we took uh, Ian was the one who did who, who filmed the thing and then we would talk about like what we are we are looking at um, because it's quite quite strange because we, we with the sewing machine and the pastel and motor we knew what we wanted to do but then after we took the the footage and tried to understand why certain things. And I, I, it's not finished yet. So I think that also like when when Ian makes the film, he's attracted to certain things. And I still can't really see <laughs> why they are there. But uh, I think he persists in put, putting them there. So I also have to like refocus my views of uh, to, to be able to understand it. Um, I think that when they they do, they do tell us and the stories are actually really, I don't think that they are architectural in the way that speak to us or architects but they they do have a sp I think that they do have a space in the flat itself like that very heavy thing that uh, the woman Mrs. Go puts it on the floor and then she pounds the chili I mean the flat is so modern and then there's this big piece of very uh, something that's so heavy that as a as an elderly person to carry it and then to put it on the floor and it's never put on on the countertop because it would crack the surface because it's so big and it's uh it's something that comes from another time and you see like it persists in making and everything has become like as i said it's become seamless and smooth and invisible and uh, i mean even people are stopping uh even to hang out laundry because people use dryers it's just like you put it in and then you take it out it's done um, so there's this, they, I mean, I see it as like trying to also, also that these objects persist, like the sewing machine. The flat is very small, but the sewing machine is such a big thing and still there. And it's somehow like a, a resistance of wanting to have a say in how one wants to live uh, and persist. Mm. And also to be able to hear your neighbour's resistance, whether it's by the pop, pop, pop of the thing <laughs> or the whir of the sewing machine, or that they're not using a dryer, they're putting out <laughs> their dripping washing. Dripping water, yes. Yeah. No, I love this sense of a flat only making sense in between other flats and how important that is to all those objects and, and practices. Um, I think I'm afraid that we have reached the very end of our hour. Um, so 
I think I'm going to have to say thank you very, very much for your wonderful presentations. Um, thanks so much to everyone for being here. I hope we can continue these conversations. Um, I don't know when the next AAD session is, but if you um, follow us on our website, um, you'll be able to, to see what's going on. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's probably the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lillian, and thank you, Mariana. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much, Edwina, for sharing, um, and Lillian for a wonderful presentation. And thanks to our audience.